I should probably say a bit about where I'm coming from. First of all, I don't have much of a credibility through status. I didn't go to prestigious universities for my PhD. Um, I haven't won awards or taught at important institutions. I'm not famous, and I like it that way. I want the ideas I am proposing to be considered on their own merits. I don't want to doll them up. And not only that, I didn't. I never succeeded at that stuff. That wasn't my focus. I have a large community of people who share common questions. That is, there are some key fundamental questions that drive my work and drive the work of many academics. You can think of an ap academic field as a set of questions, a set of accumulated assumptions or knowledge, facts and all that, and also its method. That is, how does it shop for improved interpretations within the field? I have lots of people who I connect with on the questions. Um, I don't have as much of the accumulated assumptions as some do. That is, I am not someone who could give you, for example, a detailed account of Jungian archetype theory, for example, or how ribosomes work. I didn't turn out to be very encyclopedic. I've had the good fortune to work very closely with someone who's extremely encyclopedic. So I'm basically parasitic off of his encyclopedic capacity. This is Terence Deacon. And off his credibility. To the extent I ever need credibility, I'm parasitic off of his. I've worked for 30 years with a guy who taught at Harvard. He got his PhD there and, and then taught at Harvard and was a full uh, professor at Berkeley in neuroscience and biological anthropology. That's the closest I have to cred, is that, that this fellow finds me fine company, intellectual company. And we're together easily eight hours a week, um, mostly talking. So I'm not encyclopedic, and I have these questions in common with so many others. But there's a methodological difference that is huge for me. I mentioned Jungian archetypes. If you look across most of the fields in science, the methodology is something like reverse engineering, though in the abstract. So try this out. I want to understand how the mind works. So I make a model and I give names to different parts of it. So the anima, animus, and there's the, you know, the shadow and the unconscious and the collective unconscious. I, I create categories. And then I put them together in a map or a hierarchy as if I were going to make a machine that represents what the mind does. This is rife. This is, you could say, the normal science methodology. Um, uh, and there are people who are extremely rigorous within that methodology, far more rigorous. But I eschew that methodology. Rather than trying to imagine, ab create an abstract model of what I'm trying to explain. I have to explain it from the ground up. This is what I learned working with Terry. He's extremely methodical and also rigorous in his thinking. He doesn't make up categories of things like the anima and animus. He doesn't do that even in biology. He has to explain everything from the ground up. So you could say in a way, um, I'm an uh, underqualified snob. And it's just about this thing about methodology. That it's, it's not because I'm in a prestigious, high-credibility uh, status. That is not the source of my snobbery. My snobbery has to do with rigor. I find having to explain how categories emerge from what precedes them makes for more rigorous theorizing than the kind of thing you get in consciousness studies, psychology, even biology, even evolutionary theory, all of the biophilosophy work, where you basically get to do, I call it aping, abstract parallel engineering. And wrote an academic article about it, Not didn't get very far because it's actually, it's an outside idea. The elephant is the room.
But anyway, um, abstract parallel engineering. Okay, you got these two parallel realms. You got physical matter, and then you got these abstractions, where you know, like feelings or motivations. We don't actually know what they are, but they're they are clearly apparent to us. And you got these two realms, so they're parallel realms. And what you do is you look at some behavior. And then you come up with a model of it. And if you're in the social sciences, you'll never have to build this model. It's just an abstract model. So it's abstract parallel engineering. You're just putting it together. Whereas that's not how things came about. Things didn't get engineered from the start. Obviously, if you if you believe in God, then you got that one solved the way the scientists handled later stuff, like consciousness. That is, you talk about it like it was engineered. No. We didn't fall from grace. We're not made of grace. We rose from slime. And by slime, I even mean inanimate mud. I mean, you have to start from where we began. No, I have to start from where we began at the most fundamental level that that makes any sense to start to from, which is the second law of thermodynamics, which is that stuff tends to fall apart. And so we have to explain organisms and all the way up. So that's why anybody should find me worth following. It's got nothing to do with my credibility or my uh, encyclopedic knowledge. I've accumulated some stuff over the years, but that's not me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that bright that way. I'm not, I'm not that meticulous. But I do represent an approach that is built from the ground up rather than being aping, abstract parallel engineering. So that would be the main reason to pay any attention to me if you were interested in those topics. From my perspective, the, the various models are all interesting, enough that I will pay some attention to them. I know the basics of most of the models, um, but, but I'm not interested in modeling. I'm interested in explaining. I, we call this work deep etiology. That is, you're trying to really understand from the origins up with continuity, with no breaks, with no, and then a miracle happened. That's, that's the reason to pay any attention to the stuff that I offer, even in the political realm. It's because I'm grounded in that. I haven't made leaps. I'm not making model, models. I'm not, I'm not describing. I'm trying to explain and build explanation out of that. I'm gonna add at the end of this a video I made a while ago that, that illustrates how you would do this with the clinical diagnostic term, dark triad. If you really want to understand what's going on with the dark triad, you don't start with some engineering model of how motivations and you know any of the many models for how, how behavior works. You have to understand what would be driving it from the origins of life, why all organisms would desire to be in their respective limitations, Machiavellian, psychopathic, narcissistic. It's easy to see it, but I want to explain it from the ground up. I don't want to just say, oh, he's got those three traits and therefore that's what he is. It's a different focus. The vast majority of what you find on YouTube is going to be done in that abstract parallel uh, engineering approach. And by parallel, let me, let me show you what I mean. Uh, if I said that a hormone triggers a motivation, I'm moving from the physical realm of chemicals, hormones, to the other realm, the parallel realm of motivations, without ever having explained how I did that. It's just my modeling. Okay, so just wanted to make that clear for anybody who's interesting, anybody who's interested in who the fuck is this guy? Why does he, why does he keep talking at me? <laughs> the dark triad personality, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. The three-in-one diagnostic terms psychologists use to describe people who play God, mindlessly, heartlessly, and robotically chewing through everyone in their path. What's up with this personality type? Here's a possibility, starting with the origins of life and ending with dreams of God. Organisms struggle for their own existence, making functional fitted effort to keep themselves integrated. That's four traits. Functional means useful, good, valuable, beneficial for the organism. Fitted means well adapted to circumstances, situation responsive, savvy. Effort means doing work to stay functionally fitted. 
Integrated means homeostasis, maintaining the internal checks and balances that keep a critter alive. We humans have language, which makes our lives tricky. You've got way more to worry about than a dog does. We're an anxious species, but language also gives us the power to imagine escaping that anxiety. We can picture the idealized state of those four survival qualities. That's God. We imagine God as omnificent, meaning all-beneficial, as omniscient, meaning all-savvy, and omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, able to make any effort. Now, if God is all-powerful, can he make a mountain so big he can't move it? If he's all-knowing, can he create a puzzle so hard he can't solve it? And what's the deal with evil? If he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-beneficial, he should be able to prevent it. The theological answer is God is one. He wouldn't contradict or trick himself. He works in mysterious ways. He's got perfect integrity, no cognitive dissonance. Playing God means acting like we're all good, all-knowing, and all-powerful, which we aren't. We're somnificent, somniscient, and somnipotent. We've got some goodness, knowledge, and power. So how can we play God? With a shell game, I'll call the Asshole Trinity. Since I'm a god, I should win. To win, I should sin. I'm a god since I win. Narcissism is acting like your god, omnificent, all good, and therefore duty-bound to be all-powerful. Being all-powerful is psychopathy, merciless on your mighty mission, free to manipulate everyone. Manipulating everyone is Machiavellianism, all-knowing. You've got the dirt on everyone, so you can trick them and win. And when you win, that proves you're like a god. Dark triad personalities declare holy war on everyone in their way. Holy war is an oxymoron. Holy means clean, but war is dirty. No deed too dirty for a god like me. So how do God players handle their nasty God-playing hypocrisy? By whipping out that fourth godly trait, declaring themselves to have perfect integrity. Hypocrite? Not me. I'm like God, eternally right, righteous, and mighty. I work in mysterious ways that would confuse mere mortals like you. Psychologists tend to treat these traits as innate, psychopathy especially, but it's easy to see why people would want to play God. It's so much easier than being human. Holy war is one way to fall into the God-playing habit. When we declare war, we forget our own faults. Feeling righteous, we're steeled for more war. It's a vicious, virtuous cycle, and why people who play God are half the time scorning you for your immorality and half the time laughing at you for caring about morality. Playing God is a feeling thing, having nothing to do with what we claim to believe. Anyone can play God, even atheists. Words become weaponized, just snarling and crowing sounds, bulldozing BS that works if people let us get away with it. And many will. Snarled at, conscientious people tend to back down. God players love that.